And thank you all for joining us for Poetry in the Pandemic, a reading and conversation with the Aladdin poets. All four poets are widely published and locally active and recognize in present, presenting this event uh, how people everywhere have turned poetry to poetry for consolation and as a means of expressing in these trying times. So uh, next I'm gonna turn it over to Robin, uh, who is organizing the Spring Lights event that this event is part of. Hi everybody, my name is Robin Schwartz and I'm the uh, program and grant director of the Community Arts Partnership of Tompkins County. And um, this is day two of the Spring Rights Literary Festival. It's one of our programs. And today's event is hosted by the Tompkins County Public Library. So thank you, TCPL. We have 37 more free on Zoom Spring Rights Literary Festival events. I'm gonna put the link to uh, the Spring Rights schedule in the chat. And um, tonight, for example, at 6 p.m., there's a reading with five writers. And at 7.10, we have Literary Jeopardy with host Bob Prohl and uh, one of the celebrity guests is Mayor Savante Myrick. So it's not only readings and panels and writing workshops, it's also some really fun stuff as well. Um, I'm just gonna thank our wonderful Spring Rights sponsors, Ithaca College, Wegmans, m and Bank, CFCU Community Credit Union, the Odyssey Bookstore, and the Ithaca Marriott. And we also receive support from New York State Council on the Arts and Poets and Writers helps us pay our participating writers. So thank you very much. And uh, um, back to Sophia. So I'm Sophia, I'm a librarian at the Tompkins County Public Library and I am very excited to be hosting this event. Just wanted to ask everyone to remain muted uh, for this event uh, throughout. Any questions you have for the discussion afterwards, at any point, please feel free to put them in the chat and I will ask them during the discussion period. Also feel free to put any comments you have in the chat as well while they're reading. Uh, so with that all said, uh, our first uh, poet reader is Jack Hopper. He served twice as Tompkins County Poet Laureate in 2015 and 2016, and is one of the founder editors of Cayuga Lake Books. So Jack, you want to unmute yourself and take it away. Unmuted. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you all, especially the library and of course Cap, Robin and Sophia for, for your work and welcome. My first poem is called Mosul on the 4th of July, a pandemic parable. The explosions sounded real enough, like the Civil War bombardment of New York City and gangs of New York. Right out there in the Hudson, lobbing shells at their own people. Yet all I could think of was Mosul, as real as Paris. Though I'd never been to Mosul, let alone the Middle East, Mosul seemed real to me, the obverse of a coin toss, the result of which decreed life or death. It had been on the, on the news, shots of men with automatic weapons, robotically responding to other fighters down the street. A little boy looking at the camera with wide-eyed, almost languorous anticipation. When will it end? Then a father carrying a limp body that may have been his son, who may have been dead. The bombardment continues. Tonight, there are only reenactor victors. Imaginary red-coated Brits of die imaginary deaths. Their blood and their bodies paint the sky, bleed colors unknown to the human body. It is theater. We watch, we listen, instructed, chastened. They are taking back the second largest city in Iraq, Mosul. What is left will take years to rebuild, repopulate. They will do it because it is home. They did it in London. They did it in Berlin. They did it in Tokyo. Dresden must be, a beautiful, must be beautiful this time of year. Terrible being that war is always with us. That's the pandemic. This is a much <laughs> more, more peaceful poem called White Space, uh, which I wrote uh, after watching a neighbor shoveling a sidewalk in Ithaca's eternal snow. 
white space. George Brack is shoveling his sidewalk and sidewalk with a, with a pallet knife. Squares of asphalt appear. Design is everywhere, awaiting to be uncovered. He steps back, surveying the enormous canvas, smiles to think what Pablo would have thought of it. Nothing, this space is mine to fill, he says, and knows and closes with his brush to root another cube. This poem is called Journal of a Plague Day. Stark limbs of trees tango across the cerulean wash near sunset, hold their breath at breaks, whether to push out leave leaf buds or wait for the end of snow. We've been there too, uh, snatching at sequences, the good days followed by the bad, waiting for roses in a dance partner's teeth or not, celebrating rumors of change as if extended by the hand Michelangelo gave God to animate the Sistine Adam, pale in his lockdown. Overnight, across the lawn, dandelions spring up, spread and, sp and spangle the green grass. We only have time in amounts we cannot know till spent. The lawnmower waits in the shed. We only have each other. This is a peaceful poem, having little to do with pandemic for once. Letting go. He never had a tree house, not a magic structure where a boy could sit and not be seen, become invisible, but to a chosen few. He contemplated an older one, a rickety platform, all that was left of something someone else had built likely his father or his father's brother, one that he could never make his own, hunkered down in a hiddenness already claimed by someone else. Instead, he took the thick old rope suspended from a tree above the creek and gave himself to letting go after many and better and farther swings and over, out over the swollen waters that belonged to no one and to anyone he dropped then rose, regained the shore, the rope, swung out again and again to join the ever-changing flow. This is called Tourists. Create the computer directed for its blank page. And so I did until the space was no longer blank. Only my mind, now filled with concerns I could have done without and wondered if it had been better to have left the page so white, so empty, and so at peace, alone without the prejudices of my kind, without the crusading zeal of governments to spread and thereby justify their faiths, which automatically condemn all others who look a different way than one degree in all of Earth's 360 ticks, encompassing oceans, birds of all feathers soaring, mountains that laugh, laugh if they could at stick figures climbing them, perhaps just to tell everyone I was there. Day one of a new day. Slowly, we are on the rise from the bottom of the pandemic ocean to an underwater garden in the rain that fell so heavily you couldn't see it. Beware of the bends, hollers a doctor without any visible borders. As we stroke our way, way to the surface and say our goodbyes to dolphins who pitied and cheered us and even made like sharks when the big ones came along looking for lunch we climbed the rope ladders to the side of a very large yacht, but were not allowed on deck without our COVID passports. And the shrieks and tears of many who had ridiculed getting their shots were heard as they tumbled back into the gloomy depths, missing the party that had just begun, and the state books, the state rooms filling up 
with instant lovers and the glasses filling up with instant Long Island tea and other strong decoctions designed to promote forgetfulness, which was unnecessary, you see, because the population had instantly returned to grubby commercial pursuits they could pass along to their children and grandchildren and so on to the end of earthly time, which a few enlightened ones were already reporting was coming to an unnatural end. Amen. This is a this is a doggerel kind of a nonsense poem. Help to stamp out mental health, the sign said, and several people refused to cue, bluntly missing the point. I marched the other way and landed in Cusco, where I met the old man of Peru, busy paying his llama, numero uno. Others too refused to cue to support in, in support of free radicals and followed until Monday brought them straight up and out of their slumber and into a stranger bathroom with no showers or tubs, but only a urinal upside down and signed R. Mutt, who was busy descending a staircase as ergonomically as possible and, and refused to be interviewed transparently or otherwisely. Please to stay off the grass was all that made sense. As we left, we left. We had a good home, but we left. This is a poem written in the spirit uh, of Paul Solan, I call Pandemic Fugue. The words of our leader have broken out under my arms, between my thighs. Black postules I do not understand, though explanations abound. Children play in circles at the border between one madness and another, then fall down pretending to be dead, and they are even in their rosy belief in a heaven, in a God, in an entrance into another land. But he loves us, he says so again and again to the point, uh, as any comedian knows, repeated enough, and we'll all begin to laugh. This next poem deals with one of the, the antidotes uh, to the pandemic, one of the big ones called food. Plague pleasures. Sometimes on the best of days, I stay be inside, berating myself for losing at least a good walk, for not finding a woods into which I could disappear. And what do I do? I check the fridge and the freezer. Then my pile of recipes, and I'm suddenly drawn into cooking possibilities of which I'd never dreamt. Simple pleasures, few pots to clean up after, surrender, surrender to Olympic treasures like cassoulet or asabuco, whose preparation make imaginary guests amuse themselves till finally they get up, give up, and politely go back home because the dish has only about another hour or so to be done. And once again, full moon and empty plates. Poem about the pandemic, the thing else we through, which is climate change, uh, deals with the little ice age which started around 1800 and then until somewhere in the 1800s. And it's called Norse Greenland circa, circa 1420. Again, supply ships have not come. They fear the ice infested seas as we face longer winters, shorter seasons to grow food. Sea ivory profits sliced by rival Rus along the Don and by caravans come up from Africa. No longer berserk raiders terrorizing European lands. Here in Greenland, we're just failing farmers. Our cattle dying out, dredging in endless waters for fish, like the lowly Inuit, squeezing their fjords for speared harvest in their skinny boats. 
defeated by these changing times, already half our people have embarked for Iceland, the Faroes or Norway, homes left with such high hopes. Who will tell our silent saga of sinking roots in grounds once brooded green, impounded by an ice age unforeseen? This is my last poem and I hope it speaks for all of us. It's a poem of hope and getting out of the pandemic and getting out of the winter and entering spring. It had to do with my entering <laughs> uh, Trader Joe's to get some flowers for a dinner I was going to that night. This is only about two weeks old. A gift of roses. Another rainy day, I bought some roses at the new Trader Joe's. For your wife, a store clerk asked. Unfortunately, no, and went on shopping till time to get in line and pay. The same woman signaled me to a register. she just opened. She noticed my old Trader Joe's shopping bag, a relic I explained from years ago in San Francisco. Once again, she complimented me on those dozen white roses. For the girlfriend of a friend, I offered, adding that the boyfriend would be at the dinner too. She lifted the flowers, scratched out the price, extended the bouquet. These roses are for you and wished me a good day, which now it had become. Thank you. No, you don't. Oh, you don't? Thank you very much, Jack, for that lovely poetry. Our next reader is Laura Glenn. Laura has published a book of poems I, uh, called I Can't Say I'm Lost with Foothills Publishing and a chapbook of poems When the Ice Melts with Finishing Line Press. Also a visual artist, she works as a freelance copy editor. So Laura, if you want to take it away, make sure to unmute yourself. Thank you, Cap, um, especially Robin Schwartz. And thank you, Tompkins County Public Library, especially Sophia McKissick. And, uh, and I thank all of you for showing up. Um, the poems that I'm going to read were all written during the pandemic in, in roughly chronological order. Um, and it's interesting how quickly things change, how we, how we, what we think we need to do, uh, different perspectives. So you'll, you'll see that in the poems. Um, coded. When I was a child, after my mother went out I slipped into her oversized fur, conferring on myself animal powers before I understood their rights. Now I cocoon against harm as if enveloped by my overprotective mother who disappeared overnight. Despite worldwide evidence, no guidelines surface for continuing care. She was killed by COVID. I couldn't be there. Later, I couldn't collect her personal effects, clothes and paintings left hanging. I hope the aide who called my mom her fave and held her hand on one of her last days was able to claim the still life my by my mother that she coveted. I decline invites from sympathetic friends for safe distance walks, not trusting them any more than I trust myself, knowing it's easy to blunder. Take those talks on walks with my husband. When we stroll outside as we speak, I revert to a childhood tendency and keep swerving into him.
Um, the next poem is based on a painting by De Chirico. Um, though I, I don't find him to be the most aesthetically pleasing artist. He's very interesting. And his paintings of empty urban spaces seem so striking to me at a time when the world's streets were emptying. Um, in this painting, let's see, uh, I'm trying to hold it up so you can see. Um, you can see the statue of Ariadne from Greek mythology. Uh, he painted her a lot, a bit compulsively, you might say, or obsessively um, as a statue. This is the painting by him that I refer to in the poem. And it's the one place where he has the pedestal where she usually uh, is presented with the statue absent. The empty streets. In De, Cari in De Cairico, it's Italian piazza with empty pedestal, no one's in sight. Even the statue has fled. Now cities are deserted as his paintings. It's hard to believe just months ago, I walked through bustling piazzas, beginning to feel at home in now ravaged Italy. People play music and sing from balconies like statues of angels buttressed by hope, but they can't meet, not even for funerals. It's not so different in New York City where loved ones also die alone and mass graves recall ancient plagues. On my last visit, my friend and I sipped turmeric cafes in an installation art, I'm sorry, sip turmeric lattes in an installation art cafe. Now we talk on Zoom side by side in square compartments. What a boon to see her safe in her apartment. The train in De Querico's painting looks stopped, disintegrating colorless pennants fly in the wind. The empty pedestal brings to mind toppled Confederate monuments. Though in the dreamlike melancholy painting, the statue of abandoned Ariadne de Querico, painted again and again, has given up sulking and broken away from her base, escaping the Spanish flu or maybe the plague of fascism. The artist suffered through both at different times. Today, the two coincide. Is the clock on the station a reminder of timelessness that this will pass? Or a reminder of a different kind? That plagues and fascism recur? It's not a question of liking the painting or not. Desolate, with flat arcades, it isn't a pretty picture. As part of a series of paintings of abandoned cities, eeriness spreads beyond the canvas, just as emptiness now spreads from street to street, state to state, country to country. The sky in Italian piazza is Veronese green. Veronese survived another plague, painting with dazzling colors. There's an acrid tinge to that verdancy, almost the promise of spring. I try to convince myself the future will again hold multitudes, though it's hard to see, hard to believe the astounding reversal that our empty streets are suddenly packed. Protests over a murder, a racist police act have spread, spread from street to street state to state, country to country. Though I worry the gatherings might make the virus rebound, they fill me with hope for change and dread that change might not happen.
for now. The robin snatches last year's grass for this year's nest. Corvids and the downy woodpecker pokes off suet. The gray catbird sings praises in many voices for the birds we feed, then jabs its beak into the tangerine it shares with the orange oriole. A squirrel aces acrobatics to eke out seeds from the bird feeder. Farther afield, as if in a pastoral painting, my husband coaxes beauty from the cracked earth. This year he plants more things to eat, depositing seeds in neat whirls. Now and then spats crap up, I'm sorry, crap up between us over just how careful we must be. On our walks, when people move toward us on the sidewalk, I sidle away, though I think I see compassion in the eyes of some masked strangers. After all, we might be saving each other's lives. I look up in thanks to a cherry tree whose infinite arrangements of blossoms on dark branches, pink against blue sky, move me through other dimensions. A pretty proliferation, unlike the ubiquitous image of the invisible virus, that red fleur du mal, that mace-like bludgeon. It's already May, yet small petals from the trees blend into flurries of real snow. It's not even winter, I'm not, it's not even summer, yet it's winter I dread, the threat of increased spread. It's hard to think in the future tense. We shudder back inside, fall into a rhythm of getting along. My travel dreams are packed, locked, and hidden beneath the bed. Our impatience erodes heavy rocks in a sedimenting stream. Just for a moment, I forget all suffering and want time to stand still. There's nothing to come between the soft edges of our boundary in this holy time of holing up. Snow globe. It's not the small outdoor rendezvous I expected, not my own little bubble. Awash in people, I'm the only one who's masked. Guess I me charily, as if I've shown up for a costume party by mistake. Don't worry, someone smirks. I'm wearing the emperor's new mask. Someone else charitably waves a loopy wand my way. Galactic sized bubbles flow through the air like liquid glass. What an iridescent moment, blue, violet, transparent. I'm captivated, then encapsulated. Through the giant lens, I eyeball other bubbles as they glom onto each other, then pop open. Inside my crystallized bubble, I begin to wobble. So I balance my arms and legs like the Vitruvian woman and the wind cartwheels me to the dead of winter. As if unshaken, I watch snowfall outside my snow globe. Soon bullets of hail rattle my cage. How long must I remain in this transparent orb watching the world falling apart. From the ground up, rhyme rises, a sublime leafy tracery, pale reminder of spring. In the next poem, there, there might be little phrases that sound familiar because I, I borrowed just slightly from T.S. Eliot, a nursery rhyme, Plath, Lewis Carroll, and an insight from Gail Hulse Warhaft about suddenly seeing many people at once after not seeing any. <laughs> Masks. My only new apparel in 11 months, 
I measure my days in masks that rotate. Monday's mask is fair of face. Wednesday's mask is cloaking mask me. We all need masks with photographs of our faces. I have a mask with sky blue flowers and another with indigo stars, a rosy mask with Florentine curlicues, one with ochre and blue dreamtime dots. There's a mask flaunting a rainbow of cats and a cloth covering with books in a colorful row. There's also a delicious mask that dangles tropical fruits over my mouth. What's more, someone sells me a mask like reflections in Monet's pond. Though I never see people, I'm also given one with a fan of plum blossoms. I receive a mask I wish were fragrant, green pine needles. I could save all of them in case there's a next time, or at the end, swatch together a crazy quilt. I resist spending the day in bed, comforter pulled over my head, radio blathering news about surrealistic pillow man. Despite dismal moments, I still cherish life. And when I can try to live fully, I mask up for a walk with my spouse, but my ties come undone when I talk, talk, talk due to the muscular strength of my jaw. Seeking something that hugs my face I try laces, straps, ear loops with toggles. With pre-traumatic stress disorder, before braving the defunct Sears for my first vaccine dose, I double up a hound's tooth mask with a Chinese N95 knockoff. In quest of protection, I'm endangered. The room holds more people than I've seen in 11 months. And though masks, even heroic health workers get too close. No one blinks at my get up, coat, hat, vinyl gloves, chin high scarf overlapping two masks, nothing showing of me but my eyes behind glasses, scoping the setup from a line that staggered. Finally, my first dose burns my arm in a good way, like a shot of whiskey down the throat. The last poem I'm going to read is Haze Phase. The deeper I burrow, the closer I get to the dead, as if they could protect me, and they do. Death brought this vague plague to life for me, my loss incalculable. The roots of the hellebore poke through the earthen ceiling, last sign of winter, first of spring, not ensconced alone. Sometimes I hear you sleeping to the sound of rainstorms. When napping to the static between conflicting stations, I dream of emerging safely. Sometimes I hear you howling, but it's just coyote sounds. When we're up and about, we give each other reason to quell our fears, reason to wash, away bad moods. There's pressure to mingle before I'm ready. Is somebody trying to smoke me out of my lair? I step up and out, no one's in sight, not a trace of smoke perturbs the air. I breathe deeply, a moment of sun on my naked face, then lift the downcast hellebore flower to the light. Yet with signals unclear, I still don't know how to behave these unnuanced days and refuse to break my fragile rules, pure and shiny as the frill of ice around that mud puddle. Then my faceless shadow faces the small pond for a flash, imagine itself a large fish I follow my shadow around the water hall, then down squares of sidewalk till it finds itself overlapping, joining other shadows. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Laura, for that wonderful set of poetry. Up next, we have Gail Holst Warhaft. Gail is a poet, prose writer, and translator of Greek literature. She has published two volumes of poetry, uh, Penelope's Confession and Lucky Country. Her latest book is The House with the Scorpions. So Gail, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Sophia, and, and thank you, Robin and Kat. And um, I think a lot of us in the early stages of the pandemic were writing poems, comparing this to the only thing we knew in literature, never having lived through either the Spanish flu or the plague. And um, there was in, in uh, England a, a volume, Poems for the Year 2020, and um, one of my first poem I'll read was published in that volume. And I noticed what a wonderful variety of poems there were, but all of them had this notion of a recurring plague. So this poem that I'm going to read is called Athens 430 BC. Plague fell on Athens in the second year of the Peloponnesian War, like a thunderbolt hurled by angry Zeus. When Spartans attacked the countryside, Farmers abandoned olives and vines and fled for safety to Athens, where they found disease had ravaged the city. In the Agora, where men once strolled discussing philosophy in fragrant pine shade beside the temple, bodies were heaped like scythed wheat. Soon the farmers succumbed. No one was spared, rich or poor, artist, soldier, doctor, baker, poet, no human art or science was of any help at all, Thucydides wrote. Funerals for those who had someone to bury them were quick and quiet. Most Athenians died unwept, unsung. Nothing protected the great city or its citizens crowded under the Acropolis. The historian caught the plague himself. He had seen what war could do, but groped for words to say what seemed too much for human beings to endure. People felt a burning in their heads, their mouths bled, their voices grew hoarse as crows, their chests ached worse than that was the thirst no water could quench, a fever so fierce they couldn't bear clothing to touch their skin. Some leapt naked into water, hoping for relief. In despair, Thucydides tells us the people turned against Pericles, but their leader was a man who knew how to handle a hostile crowd. I know that war and now plague have taken the heart out of you, he told them. Just realize that the Spartans will go. Plague will pass. You'll still be citizens of a great city. So the inevitable comparison for me was with New York. And this poem is called New York 2020. Someone's always to blame for misfortune. Athenians blamed Spartans. Now it's the Chinese. A rash of rumors erupts and spreads. Dishonest leaders know um, how to act. The enemy set it loose. Nothing ever happens by chance. Doctors don't tell us about remedies. Vitamins, sunlight, tinctures, prayers. Why not try a cure for malaria? Those with money drive to the Hamptons to spend what they have on decadence, ordering caviar brought in to their door. As deaths decline, the desolate city waits. Will the virus come back? Will markets open, schools, bars? Broadway is still silent, but on the sidewalk, a man lifts his horn and plays a song for the city that boasted it never slept. Ain't no love in the heart of the city. Was this once a great city or just a peddler of shiny dreams? Warden, who sat one September in a dive on 52nd Street, had read his Thucydides. He knew nothing ends the habit forming pain. We're bound to repeat mistakes we've made. We swear to be better, rise higher, give a hand to the friend who's down. Fatuous leaders promise change, but most just want to see the city go back to normal. Sadly, they will. Back in Greece for this next poem, it's called The Theban Melody. 
It's all your fault, Oedipus, the plague that ravaged Thebes, killing cows, blighting crops, causing stillbirths. You should have died, exposed as an infant, but pity intervened. Better never rescued. You killed your father, married your mother, fathered children with her, but neither she nor you suffered the plague. More poor people died than rich, as Sophocles observed in Athens where war and plague arrived together. The blind prophet Tiresias blamed pollution of the palace for the plague, but the chorus had their doubts. Let Ares turn, they said, and leave this land. Go back to Thrace whence you came. Did capricious gods doom the king, or did he condemn himself? Prophecy fathers all in Sophocles' play. Those who see the future curse the present. What we hear with dread, we must fulfill, like Cassandra or Macbeth. Oedipus is bound to follow where blind Tiresias leads. Only Jocasta, Jocasta knows the price of knowledge. She loses a husband and a son, Thebes a king. The plague passes, but who knows why? Like war, sickness comes and goes, the drama lies elsewhere, in the terror and pity we feel for a man's pursuit of his own ruin. Paradise Lost. The Thirty Years' War raged in Europe. King James died. Then came the plague. The rich fled to their country estates. Without arms, the London poor starved. Bread was soon a luxury. The dead lay heaped in the streets. A student still at Cambridge, Milton wrote an elegy for the Bishop of Winchester, not to praise him, but warn the heedless rich that Libertina, goddess of corpses, would soon knock on their gilded manor doors. They should prepare for judgment day. Milton was not afraid of judgment. The tracts he wrote would have cost his life, yet when plague returned, he fled London to Chalford St. Giles. He knew the work he carried there would seal his claim to immortality. In his blind nights, he entreated his muse, what in me is dark, illumine. He had a vision of paradise to finish, one brilliant in loss, duller in recovery. Social distancing. Standing apart might save your life, but how far apart? Stephen Bradwell wrote in The Plague of London, if you stand to talk to another, be distant from him the space of two yards. If you suspect the party to have the infection, let the space of at least four yards part you. 40 scientists signed a paper published in Lancet in May 2020, asserting that staying apart by a meter or more was shown to reduce infection. Added benefits, they noted, were likely with even larger distancing. How much? Two meters or more was their estimate. How did a man in the 17th century come to the same conclusion as experts? It wasn't by instinct or vague surmise. He saw who succumbed and where they lived. The poor died faster, sailors on ships, a boy with a cough who roamed the streets, drinkers, shoulder to shoulder in pubs. He kept his distance and survived the plague. Not everyone has to die of it. This last short poem is about Apollinaire and it's called Apollinaire and the Spanish Flu. Wars and plagues go well together. What one fails to effect, the other achieves. Apollinaire defined his era's isms, fought with France's heroes, came home wounded, but in lieu of a medal, died of Spanish flu. Save me, doctor, he cried out, plaintive on his deathbed. I want to live. I have so much to say, he declared, and a wife pretty and red-haired, who hoped she'd continue to be his muse, but he wrote no more for his jolly rousse. 
he knew there was much he'd, he'd never see and asked the world to take pity on me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gail, for that very historic poetry. Both lovely. Uh, next, we have Peter Fortunato. Uh, he is an author and artist, a ceremony maker, and a hypnotherapist in private practice. His most recent book is called Carnivale, uh, which is a novel, not poetry. Uh, he has lived in Ithaca for most of his life. So Peter, take it away. Hello, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm so happy to be here and uh, so grateful to my fellow Aladdin poets. Uh, we've been meeting together for years and many of the poems that you just heard were poems that uh, we, we workshopped to, together. And I was so pleased in many cases to hear final versions of the poems. So I have uh, quite a variety for you. Uh, and uh, I write in a variety of tones of voice, and sometimes I write in voices other than mine. Uh, this first poem has an epigram uh, from Robert Hunter. Some of you will know who he is, and you will know these lines. Let it be known there is a fountain that was not made by the hands of men. And the poem is called Astonished. I'll tell you what astonishes me. At 5.52 a.m., it's still dark and the temp is minus 10 Fahrenheit. And I'm astonished as I write this that Robert Hunter is, although present in my mind, absent. Absent, but also present. Just moments ago in a dream, I was backing a large SUV out of a tight parking spot. And then he was in my living room singing Ripple, intoning it strangely, seeming to panic when he couldn't remember a word. I piped up music when actually, as I knew immediately upon waking, the line is, let there be songs to fill the air. Then I remembered Hunter is dead. Outside my window, it's so black that I can see my face clearly on the glass in a darkness inseparable from the reflection. I'm astonished that writing this Cairo suddenly comes to mind, the time that a hustler promised my wife and me that if we ate pigeon meat at his brother's cafe down the street, we could make love all night long. Cairo, near to me this morning, but also very far away. Cairo, where the great Sphinx lives in Giza, across the street from Nazla El Siman, the world's largest sculpture, a lion man, carved from the plateau's bedrock, where for thousands of years it's been watching the sky for when the star shape of Leo will rise again on the horizon, as it did around 25,000 years ago. The builders seem to have known that we, who nowadays sift subatomic particles searching for God, would need to be reminded of the order in the sky and what's behind it. Astonishing. By the way, Khafre didn't have the statue made, and Tutmos only restored it. The Sphinx seems always to have been there, like a great cat crouching. I'm astonished all of this makes sense to me as I contemplate my reflection in a window so black I'm once again back in Egypt, the black land. No, Actually, this doesn't astonish me, although it is quite amazing how every morning out of dreams and memories, I'm recreated. This is, I never wake up feeling white. I wake up in the dark almost always, say at four or five, like today in time to catch the rising of a waning moon. Before dawn, outside, I watch it drift through a clear December sky above a stand of trees that look as if they're rooted in their shadows, stretching on the snow. Who am I but what I see and feel? Standing on my porch in the faint moonlight, I'm nothing but an empty shape. Would that be true if I were black? It occurs to me that I might breathe some molecules the Buddha once exhaled, 
or George Floyd's final gasp and last word, mama. Gravity has sealed the atmosphere. All our planet's energies recycle here. You maples and black walnut trees, each spring your leaves return and sunlit share with me your oxygen. My thanks. Today, your outlines have informed me. The base. I lie on a table while 10 skilled fingers turn my head this way and that, gently liberating the crimp that's caught me, the pain in my neck. And this is the thought that out of nowhere comes. I see the why of his appeal. I don't scorn or pity them, whether they are farmers who believe their only choice is do what Simon says, or witless boys who guzzle milk to drink themselves the whitest they can be, or feckless women who believe their leader is more ladies' man than perp. Nor do I deride the crowds selected to applaud the would-be pharaoh on TV. Nope. But I know that if they're not all evil, that is truly base. In any case, their choice of idol is misplaced. Although his base is varied, all feel dispossessed and desperate to be graced, like they imagine him, whose anger and ignorance are so great. I wrote a lot of poems during the pandemic and put together a poetry collection. And uh, here's one of my favorites, but it's written in a voice other than mine. This is titled, Didn't and Did. I did do his hair, honey, and held his head in my hands and listened close and thought I could maybe help him do a better job because he wouldn't need to think so much about his pompadour. Or what did you call it? That goose who lays the golden egg? <laughs> It has got to sit just so, and believe me when I say his bed hair is nothing pretty, which is why I used to use the doo-goo on it. I used to use a lot of things, including wax pomade and tea tree oleo shampoo and maca mix I made myself, but doo-goo did it better. Yes, he is a natural blonde. Well, sort of just what's left, which is very white, of course, and why I said he should go platinum. But gold is good. Gold is bold. Gold is what he loves, you know. No, he didn't say right away, you're fired, like on television. But I knew, I knew that look. My doo-goo done me in. Lucky I didn't sign no NDA like the girls who do his toenails do. And it's lucky for you too, honey. It's why you've got my story. Now pay up like he didn't for what I did. So in uh, the book that I've been putting together, there's a long section of poems. Uh, the section is titled Adawa, which is the oldest name, the Arabic name for Doha, the capital of Qatar which is in the Persian Gulf and where I worked and lived for several years teaching at Weill Cornell Medical College. So this poem, The Peninsula, refers to Qatar, which is a tiny peninsula. There's a couple of Arabic words in it you might not know. Dows, D-H-O-W-S is the transcription. Those are fishing boats. Uh, mar. M-A-H-R, that is a dowry that uh, Arabic bridegrooms pay to the bride and the bride's family in marriage traditionally, the peninsula. On this gypsum spur, you learn to compromise. Dust-filled skies, high winds, sun glowering, a fleet of dows waiting out a sandstorm. 
Meanwhile, gas beneath the desert floor wells up and into bank accounts. Colossal wealth accrues. We count in billions. Offshore, there is more. Once you were a desert people, camels packing few possessions to the outskirts of the Rub al-Khali. On your isthmus, Adawa became a fishing town. Bismillah, in the name of God, you still give your daughters. Some for pride betrothed the bride, but others, lucky ladies, I was told, are they whose white-robed grooms arrive with love besides abundant more. Four wives are still allowed, but nowadays expensive to keep happy. Every path recedes behind a journey. Now your women drive themselves in black Mercedes. The culture of your children grows a mystery. So as I said, uh, uh, Doha is the capital city of Qatar. Qatar is transcribed in English, of course, with a Q at the beginning. This poem is titled Capital Q. One. Lately, while I'm making English come alive in Qatar, lately I've been telling students of my life back home. By the way, it's not pronounced gutter as Bush Jr. did but in English, more like Cutter, where I'm living all alone. Two, I used to be a typesetter, taking pleasure in the heft of letters, words and sentences inverted and reversed in my composing stick. So I know the minuscule or lower case do most all the heavy lifting. The majuscule, like upper classes everywhere, have got it easy, except for Q. The capital has little U to carry on its tail. Three, Q U, I might say, pointing to myself in a mirror as if directing a scene from my life. Reversed, I could be a man of questionable character. I'm not, but sometimes feel the part, cut off from my wife in Doha, here, family rhymes with life, and bachelors, like lonely lions, are regarded warily, or else pitied. White collar and tie at work, my residence a spacious flat, still I'm one of the many paid to do the country's heavy lifting. When students ask me how I manage all alone, I quote my house cleaner. Oh, sir, you must be strong. I rode a lot of wonderful horses when I lived in the Arab world, rode them in Egypt. I rode them very often in Qatar. And uh, here's a poem about uh, the last riding club I belonged to and the last Arabian stallion that I had access to. The poem is titled Al Samria, which is the name of Sheikh Faisal's farm and riding club. Uh, Sheikh Faisal uh, is a very interesting man, one of the royal family. Al Samaria. The Sheikh's imported masons build the walls of his museums and riding school. Shwe Shwe, step by step, out into this desert I am soon to leave. So soon, by plane away from what I can't rejoice in anymore. This desert. I'm crossing it for one last ride. My Mount Salim, blinking, blowing sand, picking his way among piled stones and treacherous hollows until he halts and pricks his ears at rows of date palms in the slanted light. The farm is a paradise whose winding track we tread amid the girth high reeds where peacocks roost in trees and peahens brood, where purple bracts of bougainvillea sprawl and vines of perfumed jasmine blot out memories of dust and diesel fumes, where now beside a newly furrowed field at dusk a thumping water pump sows diamonds through the air. 
pilgrim in my labyrinth. What progress have I made, turning right, away from what will soon be left, regretting what I can't have back? Salam, I greet two weary fellaheen on their way to evening prayers. They wish me peace as well. Astride my prancing horse, I can't help feeling faintly grand to have what they have not. I wish I could apologize. A peacock flashing blue alights and cries. Salim, alert, is ready, but I hold him on the bit a moment more. I walk him past the just lit bird, then down the track we fly. And I have one more, which will bring the reading to a conclusion and bring my part of it to a conclusion. The poem is titled Fine, which I note could also be pronounced fine uh, for the end. This is a very new one. Poets love to read their newest poem. Fine, one. Brilliant objects traverse the sky according to laws that can best be described by exquisite equations. And so, if mathematics is the language God speaks, then what am I doing talking like this? Two, my brain cells number more than the lights of our galaxy. How fine. The stars farthest away seem never to change their positions. And though their light rays reach us at great removes from their moments of ignition, the distance and time are computable. Very fine. Three, very fine are the white hairs on my cat's sable chest, fine as the down of an owl's breast, fine as the circlet of flames I've just lit on my stove, blue as a sapphire bottle. Fine is my first sip of gin, and fine also is my third. Four, the tumbler before me is neither half full nor half empty. That's fine, very fine, perfectly fine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. That was a lot of uh, great energetic poetry. I appreciate that. Um, so I haven't seen, excuse me, I haven't seen any questions in the chat so far. Uh, if anybody does come up with questions, feel free to put it in the chat and I will read it. But to get us started off, I would ask, what are the Aladdin poets exactly? How did you form and where did the name come from? And anyone who wants to take that question can start. I guess I'm the oldest of the, of the Aladdin poets, am I? I don't know. Uh, we've had, I think it all goes back uh, many years to, to a group that was called OSIP, that was a group of people who translated poetry from various languages, who then became a group of poets and, and had a rolling membership that developed over the years and changed um, as people left Ithaca, as people are wont to do. And uh, we started meeting down at Madeline's when Madeline, Madeline's on the Commons. And we went from place to place. And one of the few places that we were totally accepted and welcomed in was Aladdin's Cafe in College Town. And um, so we used to be Madeline's poets once upon a time. And then we became, with this particular cast of characters, uh, Aladdin's poets. And now, of course, Aladdin's doesn't exist anymore, so uh, we may become something else, but that's how we became Aladdin's poets. Thank you, Gail. Anyone else who want to comment on that? Oh, Laura, I think you're still muted. Um, um, I'll just add that um, when we, when we met at Madeline's, um, we were called the Madeline's, which is very, I think it was very Proustian. Um, and so we just kind of shifted the name to, to uh, correspond to the place where we were meeting. 
and uh, we met pretty regularly, occasionally missing a meeting. But, um, you know, I've, I've watched uh, people come and go and it's, oh, it's been a great experience. Um, in the past, when I was younger, I, I had been on and off in a poetry group now and then. And I, um, after say a half year, even if it was a pretty good group, I, I just kind of thought I'd had it. I really needed to be on my own. And it, with this group, I feel as though, I hope it never ends, so. That's very nice. I do think we enjoy each other's company. And as you heard from the reading, it's all so different. Not one of us um, uh, writes like any other person in the group. It's all, we're all extremely different poets. Probably healthy. I think one of the things that I've noticed and uh, most appreciated over the years is that even if uh, we're not uh, discussing our poems in person, somebody has a question here about how we work as a group. Uh, I think it was uh, Kathy Morris. Um, you know, we read to each other and uh, we comment. Uh, we, we have hard copies of the poems and then we read them aloud and we talk about them. And uh, we're all pretty seasoned. So uh, we have uh, great respect for uh, the uh, responses of our fellows. And I, I was gonna say, what I notice is that whether I'm showing a poem to the group or not, I hear my fellow poets point of view and possible critique and, and what they might say to improve it. Or if they have a question, I would try to anticipate what a particular individual might question. So, so the impact continues, even if it's not a poem that we're in real time discussing in a group. I'm very grateful for that. Likewise. And, um, if I may add, I'm, I work as a copy editor, but I, I can't always see where things are unclear in my own work because I'm, I'm so inside my own mind and my own um, perceptions that have been building over the years, they seem so clear to me. So it's been helpful at times to see where, where I need to um, add a little more to, to round things out. Um, and I think at this point, we know each other's work pretty well. So we're able to pretty quickly adapt to each other's voices and, and when we critique. And our critiques, I think, are, are um, both supportive and critical where appropriate, which I, I think, you know, some critiques just kind of, you know, deadhead the, the poem. And I, and I think that we really, um, we understand that knowing what's good about a poem is as important as knowing uh, what has to be remedied. I'm looking at this um, chat room and I see that somebody's there from, from London um, or watching this in England somewhere. And uh, I thought, how on earth did somebody find out about this, Sophia? Maybe you know how people <laughs> have found out about this Ithaca Festival. She went to Ithaca College, but still, it's nice that people are, are listening to, to this reading in, in London. Yeah, sometimes people uh, stay uh, connected to the community. They're on mailing lists. Uh, they might just check in on the library sometimes. If Usually they have some sort of connection to Ithaca, I found. Um, yeah. we've. It's interesting to see people's comments in the chat room, but um, feel free to ask us any questions. We're, that's what we're here for. Um, so there was a question from Caitlin. Uh, what is the biggest benefit to you that you appreciate from being in a writing group? Jack, you haven't spoken. Why don't you, you say something for us on our behalf? Hello? No. No, you've, I think you've, I think you're muted. Peter, do you want to take that? Well, I, I would say uh, just as what I was talking about a moment ago, uh, it raises the level of your game. 
You know, I, I mean, nobody wants to write in a void anyway. But I think almost every poet wants an audience at some point, even if she says that she's only writing in her journal, you know, I think everyone wants to be read. But it's uh, extremely valuable to have uh, accomplished poets read your work, you know, when it's in its formative stage. And that, and that, I think, is a reason why the group has persisted for so long, even, even if it's been on a rotating basis. I actually am the newest member, and I was thinking, my goodness, it's probably been already at least five years since I've been in the group. And the group has gone through many of my poems that are in the manuscript I'm putting together now. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's, I think it's, um, it doesn't always work. I mean, the iterations of this group themselves have, some have worked better than others, but um, uh, one of the things that I think makes it, why this group has stayed together is diversity. If we were all writing um, in a very similar style, I think it would have uh, collapsed, but we are so different as poets that I think each one brings something new to the other one. I mean, I, I'm a poet who has to have rhythm in a poem. I've got to have a beat in a bar. And I've, sometimes I rhyme, sometimes I don't, but I've got, um, I've got to have a musical quality. Other people, I think of, uh, I mean, I always think of, of Laura's work, for example, as a, you know, being such visual poetry. And uh, there she was reading about De Chirico, for example, and it's always got such a strong visual element. And uh, I mean, I'm just thinking that we all have something different that we do that we bring to the to the meeting. And to um, to tie in the question, it, it seems like it just ties in naturally with the what it was like to meet during the pandemic. And you know, I will say that. Uh, Connecting with a lot of people has been helpful during the pandemic, you know, with my family, with uh, friends re remotely, and then, you know, occasionally a local friend outside in person. But um, the poetry group, it, there was a sense of continuity in, at a time when everything was so confusing in the beginning. And so, you know, we didn't, we just didn't know how safe we were or weren't. Um, and there, there we were continuing to talk about our poetry. And when we meet to talk about poetry, it's it's very intimate and personal. We're we're dealing with uh, issues that we're processing emotionally and intellectually both, and and yet it you know some people use the word therapeutic, and I I don't object to people using that word for themselves, but I I don't like that word for myself because even though especially during the pandemic it was very helpful to to be um meeting we're we're focusing on craft so we're dealing with all this material but there's another level to it we're working on an art um we're, we're trying to continue what we've been doing all all along so uh i i just found it very you know constructive hello can you hear me no? yes yes jack no, you've turned yourself off again. Okay, there. There. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Uh, I just want to say a, a different dimension was introduced by COVID when we switched from live meetings mm. to, uh, to 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 not need to uh, once I think we did a Zoom, but basically we we relied on uh, uh, sending our poems back and back and forth on the computer. Or, yeah, uh, and then the the advantage to me was one of rumination. Instead of talking immediately and reacting immediately to another poet that was just read his his or her poem, uh, I now I have a chance to to read and absorb and then reply. I hope a little more intelligently, and it's and I and as a, 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 a one addition to to that. I can't imagine not being part of this group because my poetry has, I know, certainly for, for me has improved considerably since I since I joined joined a few years back. And it's it's been a great. I've looked forward to these sessions so much, as much for myself as to see how the others have done, who are equally interesting. Yeah, 
that that's it. I to to respond to that, if I may, um, I I do find that I have more time to reflect on the poems over the computer when I work on the computer. I you know we we email the poems the night before the day we're scheduled to critique, and I, I actually many I, I don't know if this is true for others, but for me I kind of can't control myself. I I put many hours into re reading the poems again, writing notes, and and then emailing everyone. Um, and there is that advantage, but I, I also feel that it's so important for us to meet in person. And I, I look forward to the day that we do that again. I, I don't think we would have the same level of bonding if we, di if we didn't meet, we'd sit, sit around and have, um, you know, ha have our paninis and cappuccinos and uh, whatever we had, it would vary depending on, on the venue and talk about our lives a bit, talk about anything. And then, and then we'd, we'd segue into the poems. Um, so as much as there, have, there really have been some striking advantages to, um, to emailing the poems, and as Jack said, ruminating over them a little bit more. But, but I also think that there's, um, there's, there are great rewards to meeting in person. If we've got time, I wanted to say, I know I recognize some, some poets in the audience and um, I'm, you know, poets whose work I admire and I wonder if any of the poets or uh, I see Nancy Kudo over there, for example, uh, <laughs> Nancy, um, any poets have got any comments about uh, how this relates to them and the way they've been working over this last year and some. Um, no. Could I say something real brief? Sure. Yeah, I just have been actually after the wonderful reading, I put a few comments to everyone in the chat. And I have two questions for you because our poetry group, which is like almost all represented here, and we know you, you as well, rather well. Um, I won't name the faces that you see here because you know them. But we would love to uh, see uh, I, an anthology of the poets in Ithaca, I think would be really cool, starting maybe with Aladdin poets to have a little anthology out. You guys are very talented and already crafted. And then maybe our poetry group, we've been thinking of you know, getting to that point too. Uh, I think it's helpful because there's a real tradition of publications from Ithaca that are just, you know, smaller uh, but, but worthy projects for decades and, and decades. So there's lots of ways to get it out there, but I'm um, just wondering if you're thinking of that and also of person readings, um, in-person readings. There is, um, as my husband sitting here reminds me, a brand new, beautiful auditorium, state of the art, way too expensive in Newfield um, in the high school. They've just built it this year and they're looking for ways to uh, host events and probably recoup some of the over budget uh, money that was spent. So I'm out here in Newfield giving a plug for something I don't even know if it's possible, but you know, there's lots of venues now that are opening up thanks to uh, things moving along in the right direction in New York State. So that's just my thought. <laughs> Um, that's, that's good. Question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know what the others feel, but I feel this would be wonderful to, to think about. Um, I mean, especially after this year when people have been so confined and, and feeling a lot of them. Um, I mean, it's psychologically been a terribly hard year, not just pandemically, but politically. And uh, I think we all uh, would appreciate seeing something come out of Ithaca in terms of all these amazingly talented people that are around the town. And, and Jack, certainly the idea of reading is great. Jack, are you going to say something? Yeah. Uh, am I on again? Mm -hmm. No. Yes. 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 No, now you're not. <laughs> okay. Uh, speaking of anthologies, of course, we, we have the Finger Lakes, a uh, a poetry anthology that Kay Lake Books published a while back. 
which was very successful, 106 poets, poems, I think, poets or whatever. This is a very fertile area. But I, I would like to see, uh, pick up from the uh, your, uh, your idea of having a, 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 an anthology of our poetry group. What about all the others putting right. them together? This would be really exciting because there are a number of, of groups uh, besides individuals working out there. If we get them together, we could have a, a pretty fat and interesting book, I think. Yeah. One thing I would say about, um, am, I, am I still on? I think I am, right? Yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, so Robin had mentioned uh, previously, the first time they did Spring Rites, uh, which actually had to take place last November, uh, that there were some advantages to doing it electronically via Zoom, meaning that you could, uh, you didn't have to have a marathon event, for example. You could have small events like the one we just did, and there are going to be a number of other smaller group readings. And a person uh, didn't have to feel that uh, if they went to one event that they couldn't go to another event. And so, you know, I, I mean, I would rather meet in person and like poets since time began, I'd rather, you know, sit on sofas in person and quaff wine or drink espressos while, while we have our great thoughts and shoot our mouths off. But uh, there is something to be said for what the technology facilitates. Uh, maybe there'll be more of this. I know that uh, CAP has been very happy with the enrollment for the CAP events this year. Uh, this year. And of course, uh, for people listening, uh, there's a lot of events. It, the, it started last night, Wednesday, and it's gonna be running on and off for a couple of weeks. So be sure to check the schedule. So I, I just, not that I'm crazy about doing it all on Zoom, believe me, I'm Zoomed out like everybody else, but there are uh, some advantages that the technology allows. I, um, I want to say that I, I like Carolyn's idea of, of, of having anthologies. And I mean, what I've been imagining is, um, ooh, beautiful. What I've been imagining uh, is, a, I'm, I, don't know, I have no idea if this will happen. There's a good chance it won't. But I, I like the idea of a very timely um, anthology for, you know, for, of, for different groups or if, or if there are individuals, they can group together. But um, po poems of the pandemic, because uh, you know, it, it, this is the time for it. And there's been such an intensive focus on poetry. People seem to find it helpful in terms of processing their own experiences and getting different perspectives on it. So, I, you know, it's an appealing concept. We have time for maybe one more question. Um, see, any anyone want to pop anything in the chat really quick? You can do that. But if not, let's see. How about? Uh, I'm curious. Uh, how do you know when a poem is finished, or do you continue to tinker with it uh, for a long time? How does that writing process work for you? <laughs> Do we ever know? <laughs> That's why we're all smiling, right? <laughs> it takes forever. Was it yet who said a poem, the poem's never finished, it just put away? I think that's that's the truth, that you could go on fiddling with it forever. Sometime you get tired of it, you put it in the bottom drawer, but I think you could go on fiddling with most poems forever. I forget who said it, but uh, who, a poem is never finished, but abandoned. Yeah, that's right. I think until, until the poet picks it up again, <laughs> right? Yeah, I I tend to I, I, I tend to work and rework a poem, countless revisions. Sometimes each revision just has, you know, rather minute changes, but many revisions. And there are times when I think a poem is done, and I might go back to it a year later or even more, and and suddenly think I see what it needs to, to really kind of pull it together. 
And other times it just feels complete and it, it feels complete. You don't want to touch it. You don't want to try to improve it even because something will be lost while other things are gained. So I, I think at times it, it, that you just know and other times um, it, there's, a, there's a remaining uncertainty that something could be better. You know, one thing I've discovered over the years is that it's very often a matter of getting the music uh, right or getting the rhythm right. And if there was something that had bothered me about a poem previously, including the word choice, if I've let it rest for quite a while and then I might come back to it and I might hear it in the way that my unconscious really always intended it to be. And then, you know, then when I have the rhythm and, and sometimes rhyme and, you know, then when I have the music, the words fall into place and that often will give me a sense of completion. I don't write in regular meter and rhyme, but for example, uh, one of the poems I read, uh, The Bass, that was a poem that I brought to our Aladdin's group quite a while ago. And uh, it, it came to a, a kind of a reasonable conclusion. And I put it aside for a long time, uh, you know, and then of course we're constantly hearing about the so-called base of the so-called previous person in the White House. And then I went back to that last stanza and it really all came together and it had a lot to do with rhymes and it had a lot to do with the meter of the individual lines. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much to the Aladdin poets. We are just about at time now, so I think we'll wrap up. Uh, thank you to Robin and to Cap for putting together this wonderful spring rights events and all the many programs that go into it. Uh, so as we said, definitely check out other events if you're interested. Um, and thank you for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Take thank care. you, Sophia. Bye. Thanks to everyone. Bye. <laughs>